Hello, and welcome to Eavesdropping at the Movies. I'm Mike. And I'm Jose. And today we're talking about Laurel and Hardy. We've done them once before. Um, we've just been to see Neil Brand Presents Laurel and Hardy mm. as part of Flatback Festival, though he, it's a show that he's touring, in which Neil Brand, venerable composer, gives us uh, a potted history of Laurel and Hardy as silent stars, mm. in particular, um, and culminates by showing two of their shorts mm. from 1929, Big Business and Liberty. Yes. I really enjoyed it. Yes, I mean, you know, um, I was very admiring because, first of all, the slide show that he presents, it was just, like, so professional, right? It, it <laughs> glided by, right? Are you speaking in your capacity as someone who's been producing work for students, presentations for students? Well, yes, because you appreciate, A, how difficult it is and how often you're not thinking of the audience. You're thinking of how much you could put in or you know, or illustrating this, or yeah, like, mm. you know, uh, and you're forgetting that people are in seats watching, that there's a pace. Mm -hmm. And also, so there were two things that I admired, the, the, well, the images themselves, the pace and the rhythm at which they were shown, right? And then uh, Neil's own grace, really, yes, that he is performing this for the audience. Yeah, right? absolutely occurred to me. He's a very, very accomplished presenter. Yes. I mean, and, and there's no surprise, really, he's been doing live stuff for years and years and years, and TV documentaries and things like that as well. This is what he does. Yes, and he's got kind of, like, I suppose a, a middle-class, everyman quality or something that people <laughs> seem to really relate to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh which, I, yeah, so it's very engaging and, you know, the voice and the gestures are all kind of, I think, done with the audience in mind. It's a very performative uh, piece. Uh, and, of course, his, his main thing is, you know, that he has been playing alongside silent films, accompanying silent films, you know, on piano for a really long time. So that aspect of the, of the show, I think we should call it, Hmm. you know, was, like, effortless and accomplished and, you know, hugely entertaining, I thought. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in the first half of the show, essentially, he's giving us the history of Laurel and Hardy, um, some of which you know, um, but, as you say, it's accompanied by these images, by the, the talk of um, who they were with before they joined up together, particularly Hal Roach, who, I think, brought them together. Mm. Um and yeah, the, the I mean the the images of <laughs> the image of of Oliver Hardy as a baby is a you can see it. It's right there. He's like yes. a year old, and you can see it immediately. I, I he love is. him. You know, uh, I you know <laughs> I love him because he's got such grace. You know, kind of the way he moves. So he's this fat guy. And, you know, his fatness is part of his persona. Mm. It's also partly part of the joke, I suppose. But really the joke is that someone so heavy can move so elegantly and so gracefully and so daintily you know, on occasion, right? Because actually the daintiness of his movement is sometimes part of what's the joke, yeah? Mm. So he'll avoid something crashing onto him and do this, you know, really dainty little three step or something to move away and actually it's the, yeah it's that contrast that i think is so engaging really yeah he shows us a clip from uh, that mabel norman film that we yes. saw we saw that that mabel norman show a collection of four of her films where he appeared in it uh, as a very young mm. actor at the time um i mean it's funny because <laughs> it made me think back on that mabel norman thing because the, the mabel norman thing was all about how mabel norman was the star and it's all about yes. her and now it's no no no. we're looking at Oliver Hardy in this movie, yes. you know. Even though he is um, the bit player in it. Really. Yeah. yeah. Um, but Neil points out, you know, this it, it is his physical grace, it's his physical ability in combination with his size, mm. you know, that makes him unique and makes him special. Yes. But I wasn't just referring to that, yeah, because I think what Neil was referring to, here is this fat man, and look the pratfalls that he does, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's kind of, you know, it's a level of athleticism yeah, that you don't expect uh, in a fat person. And that Jackie Gleason also had, actually, in The Honeymooners, right? You know, it's, it's what you see then uh, um, uh, redeploy in the Flintstones. Yeah, Fred <laughs> is fat, but, you know, he can move like anything. But I'm referring to more than that. I'm referring to a daintiness of movement. <laughs> yeah, that he's got, like, almost a feminine grace, mm. yeah, in aspects of, yeah, 
of, of the way that he moves or he walks. So he uses that as a punchline to activities, yeah? Mm. Uh, that, uh, anyway, I love that uh, in him. Yeah, although I, I must say the one of the two that I still love more is Stan Laurel. And the thing that, I've given Laurel and Hardy sort of two really good goes now on the podcast because we, we, we mm. saw... Um, a few of their, we saw two of their shorts and one of their features yes. uh, at um, the Mac a little yes. while ago. Uh, like that was a local Laurel and Hardy Appreciation Society mm. thing, um, and that was really the first time that I'd watched them, and I had a mixed response to them. You know, they weren't my favourites of, of that era. I could sort of see what people got in them, but, but I just wasn't quite getting it. And I ultimately come out of this sort of feeling the same way in that I, I feel like my opinion on them is sort of settled, right? Yes. Um, but Stan is the one who I get the most joy out of because the thing that I love the most about anything they're doing is when Stan looks incredibly stupid mm. and confused and maybe does the head scratching thing. That mm. kind of like that's that's where I get the most joy out of them. Yes. I don't. I mean, I think you know. Um, also, why does one have to choose? I mean, I love Chaplin. Yeah, I, I love Keaton, <laughs> uh, and. Uh, Neil was also talking about how these films were amongst the first films he saw. Mm. And that was true of me as well. You know, I mean, I remember going into the, the church hall, right? You know, so we'd always go to church on Sundays and then kind of we'd go to the Spanish social club, you know, uh, or before that, the church hall was the Spanish social club and they would just show silent, mm. you know, comedies. Uh, and... Uh, you know, Lauren Hardy were like the bulk of, of what they showed, mm. uh, you know, and kids love them. I, you know, I love them. Um, I do think that um, we probably all have different tastes. I mean, you know, what Neil showed would not have been my favorite ones. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but you can see kind of, I mean, you know, they were funny. Uh, it worked. Uh, I think they're incredible together. I mean, you know, that whole gag about the sharing of the pants, right? <laughs> you know, I thought that was all kind of brilliant. And it is all gags and business and facial expressions mm -hmm. and, you know, surprises. And, you know, I thought it was... Uh... And like finding a hook in a scene that a, a gag is continually built out of. Mm. I forget the phrase that... Um, I think it was Neil said it's about finding the game. I think and in, in that one clip he showed, it's about the hat and it's all about how they interact with the hats. And it's totally about the pants mm. in um, Big Business, I think that was. Yes. Um, no, oh, that was Liberty, sorry. Yeah, that. no, that's the one where they escaped from prison, yeah. Yeah, um, so that's all about, about, <laughs> about the pants. The thing that was in Big Business, which, uh, again, a phrase that I was introduced to tonight, was um, reciprocal destruction. Yes. Yeah, which is a brilliant great. phrase. And, again, and as soon as you see, as soon as you're told about it, and you see an example of it. You go, oh, I, yes, I know this. I've seen this in cartoons. I've seen this in old movies. You know, and it's this thing about you inflict some damage to someone or some or someone's property, and then you have to wait politely while they do the same back to you, and then it builds up and builds mm. up and builds up. Um, we had a wonderful idea, and it's expressed very brilliantly in um, mm. Big Business, in which they're trying to sell a Christmas tree and end up getting into a fight with a homeowner. And the reason why these are so successful where others aren't is because the topping has to be continual. Like, mm. you know, if the second level of destruction doesn't top the first, the thing doesn't work, <laughs> right? So, you know, like every level of mutual destruction has to be inventive in terms of gags and, you know, how particular things are destroyed and, you know, and the timing of it. And, you know, so, I, and I thought you really saw that. It's like well, a topper after a topper after a topper after a topper. Right, you definitely do in that film. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's one of the things that I admire about all comedians or even comedy directors like Lubitsch. Mm. And, you know, I thought uh, the interesting thing about the shorts that uh, uh, Neil showed is, you know, that you see where a lot of people learn their stuff from. Yeah. So, you know, Leo McCary, yeah, a famous comedy director, was working for Hal Roach you know, the producer of all of these comedies, you know, mm -hmm. Hal Roach Studios is famous for this. And then, of course, who is the assistant director in this? George Stevens, right? Oh, was it? Yeah, you know, who did, uh, amongst other things, Swing Time, yeah, the Astairs mm -hmm. and Rogers musical. So, 
you know that gag with the with the with the picture yeah looking at uh, uh yeah you remember that gag in, in swing time where uh uh Fred Astaire promises you know to make twenty five thousand dollars and then mm. kind of marry right and the picture yeah. goes from being frowny and so on to being all smiley right like yeah you can see how you know gags like that which all revolve around timing and gesture and expression yeah mm. all come from from here really so uh and what i really appreciated about neil's talk was um that he also focused on sound well yeah. yes uh and the sound effects and you know how sound was deployed to comic effect uh yeah so because you expect also he's it, it's silent film and he accompanies um the films on the piano himself um but at one point he does say well you know they were also fantastic in sound and sound only improved them and he showed a clip from i don't know the name of the film but a, a film in which um one of them is uh, stan is shaving ollie um and they're in a sawmill and he, he says this is all about the sound and it's when he's sharpening the plane at the start you know mm. it's, it's grinding away it's a fantastic sound that, that amplifies. I mean, it's already nuts that he's going to use a plane to shave all these. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's a sound that amplifies it. Mm. The one thing that made me uncomfortable today was uh, so so Neil had it very well organized, right? So you know, he he talks about his own experience of of Stan and Ollie. Uh, then he talks about uh, uh, Stan alone, and then Ollie alone, and then their first works together. And he includes uh, a, a part of a play uh, that he wrote about Stan and Ollie. So, you know, he clearly is a mega fan. Mm. Uh, but what made me uncomfortable was the the uh, clip of Stan alone in this um, uh, film about the Klondike where a fight starts and then the swishy gay man comes in. And of mm. course, you know, the whole audience erupted at the swish, right? Yeah, so we should explain the clip a little bit. I forget the name of the film, but it's when Stan was very young and before he'd met Oliver Hardy. And he was doing this film, which was a send-up of kind of action films at the mm. time. And Neil was making the point that he, no one else was doing this, mm. you know? Um, so it's this very, very, very over-the-top fight scene that he has with another cowboy. Mm. And it goes it goes completely crazy, and it goes on for a very, very long time. And then in the midst of this scene, every every now and again, is a gay cowboy who is mincing, and all the kind of stereotype of how a gay person moves. Yeah. And he's picking out a shirt and all this. And the, and the, the way in which it interacts with the fight scene is it puts, sort of points out that this fight scene is meaningless to the people around them. It's also what happens... It's the same joke... Well, the same... Yeah, same joke that is made when they ultimately get into the bar and everyone in the bar is ignoring them. They're yes. just having this fight and everyone's ignoring them. So that's the kind of point of it. But I, I, I think this is maybe what you're going to say. I wish that it had been addressed that this is of its time a little bit. And Well, something needed addressing because I think what made me uncomfortable was, um, I mean, not the clip itself, mm -hmm. you know, because actually, in some ways, it's wonderful to see an acknowledgement of a gay person, however mincy, <laughs> right, however stereotypical and, and so on, in such an early film. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, you regret that particular stereotype, but on the one hand, you're glad to see it. Mm -hmm. It was the not being addressed, actually. And, you know, so I think also Neil set it up as a joke. The audience accepted it as a joke. And actually, there was something about the complicity of you know the presenter and the audience in that stereotype yeah. without any distancing that made me uncomfortable yeah i agree with that i felt the same thing mm -hmm. i maybe didn't feel it quite as keenly but i mm. you know I, so i looked over to you at one point and then i felt like oh am i just looking over to the gay person to find his reaction <laughs> but like but you know i think it was kind of justified because i i, I did feel that um it, yeah it was the audience's response and because the, the they're always getting very, very big laughs. Yeah, and they're laughing at the gayness. At, yeah, exactly. You know, the, so it's, it's not just it's any like old laughing... person coming in and ignoring this fight. It's yeah. that he's mincy. Yeah, it's like laughing at somebody for being black or you know or being, yeah, disabled or whatever. It, it's the treatment of you know mm. a person or a type as a joke that it makes you know for discomfort. Um, so, but that that would be my one criticism, actually. Otherwise, I thought it was like incredibly polished, incredibly professional, incredibly easy. And the thing that I forgot to say about the presenting 
is that so you know not only appreciated like the choice of image and the simplicity of the ordering mm -hmm. yeah it has a simple narrative you know but that, but that actually i did find i learned stuff from mm -hmm. it but also the size of the image you yes. know well I, I don't i don't think we've said we saw this at the electric yeah that's where it's being hosted and the electric has obviously been um redone bought out by this guy kevin markwick who mm. it turns out neil is friends with and that's one of the reasons that he's here mm. um and uh, Kevin was the he was on the right there. He was doing the 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 video and the image. And mm. So, on. but um, I'm not just referring that the size of the screen is a good size of the electric, mm -hmm. but you know that to have slides, yeah, mm -hmm. which is kind of what you have at the beginning. That size, yeah, yeah, completely behind someone, it has a kind of a an effect on you physiologically, right? It yeah. looked fantastic. Yeah. Um, so. Neil said that he was preparing to take this on tour and then COVID hit. Um, but obviously it's kind of picking up again now. And I know yes. that the electric is not the only place that it's been performed or is going yeah. to be performed. So where and wherever it shows up, it's worth seeing. Yes. Uh, yes, we both highly recommend it. And again, I mean, we must mention that this is also part of Flatpak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, which, uh, uh, I mean, we continue to praise because it continues to be praiseworthy. It keeps on kind of bringing... Uh, new and exciting events to the city, uh, of which this was just uh, one component. So mm -hmm. thanks very much to Flatback as well. Yeah. Thank you very much for listening. We are eavesdropping at the movies, and we are on. Apple Podcasts, uh, Audible, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and YouTube. On social media, we're on Facebook and Twitter, at Eavesdrop Movies. And the website, with 350-odd episodes now, is eavesdroppingatthemovies.com. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you.